All right, kids, you're off to Children's Church. Rebecca, are you leading it? You're going to miss a good sermon, but watch it on uh, YouTube. Is it good? That was not very nice, was it? No. Not very nice at all. Gosh, what a great week. So, Sunday night, last Sunday night, my son ran a 1,500 meter race and got he beat his personal time by three seconds. He went... 1,500 meters and 3.53. That's fast. And so he won first in his heat, and that was his first Division I win after this is his fifth year in that program. So he's uh, finally got a first place in that, in that uh, race. And then Monday, he gets a call from medical school. He got accepted to medical school. So, um, yeah. So there, yeah. Amen. I'm just thankful. He's, he is obviously uh, takes after his mom. He's very smart. Uh, the plan is the Air Force will pay his way through college and then he will, or through medical school, and then he'll be an Air Force doc for a few years, give him some time. So um, that's a good deal. So happy about that. My, my oldest son, who's in the Air Force, um, he proposed to his, his girly friend, and she said yes. So, uh, so yeah, we're going to have a bigger family. So anyway, these are, this has been a great week. Let's close in prayer. Because it was so good, I forgot to study for the sermon. I knew you'd understand. Wait, wait, where's Kevin? Kevin, can you turn? I'm way too... Never mind. I get, I'll just turn it away from me. I'm good. All right, here goes. Close your eyes. Just work with me. Close your eyes. Imagine that an old prophet has been sent by God to you to do or say something to you to communicate how God feels about you. He's coming to your house to deliver you that message. He's come to give you a message from God about what he thinks about you. And he comes wearing maybe a long tattered robe and sandals, wrinkled face, must be a, maybe a hundred years or old or more. Old tattered robe, long white beard, holding onto a wooden staff of gnarled wood. You get the picture. And he's knocking on your door, and you open the door. What is the message he has from God for you? What are you hearing? Okay, open your eyes. What'd he say? What'd he do? How many of you heard a message of encouragement or blessing? Okay. I won't ask for hands, but some of you heard a different word. A message of disappointment. A, a message of rebuke. Okay. Uh, yeah, but you received it as I've disappointed God. I mean, some of you, it was not a positive thing. It was a, you know, I'm, you need to straighten up. You are, you're not cutting it. You need to repent. You, uh, I'm not happy with you. In our better moments, we tend to remember something about the grace of God that we have found by trusting Jesus as our, as our Savior, as our sin bearer. That's our better moments. But mo for many of us, I'll say, we're so familiar with our sins and our weaknesses that we often forget them. We normally feel that God is really not happy with us. Maybe that he's angry with us. Or at the very least, disappointed with us. He might love us because that's what he promised to do and after all he's God so he has to do that. But he's not really happy about doing it. This morning you and I, our spiritual lives are dominated by feelings of grace or feelings of guilt. 
if it's guilt, if you struggle that, with, with believing that God really, really loves you, have I got a sermon for you. And better yet, Christ has something to say to you in this text. We're in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. And I want you to turn there. And I want to backtrack to where we left off last Sunday. As the week-long feast of booths or tabernacle or tents was just you know, rend- you know, ending the, the culmination of that week of, of um, celebration, of remembrance, Holy Week, Reflecting back on how the, their ancestors spent 40 years wandering in that hot desert wilderness, dying of thirst, looking for the promised land, and Jesus stands up and he claims to be the living water, that if you're really thirsty, he will give you himself and you will be satisfied forever. That's the feast, of, that's, the, that's the high point of the Feast of Tabernacles, and Jesus makes that claim. And then, in verse 53 of John 7, it says, everyone went to his own home. Are you there? Do you have everyone went to his own home in brackets in your text? Are there brackets? Yeah. Some of you, if you have a study Bible, you might have a note saying, does not appear in the earliest and best manuscripts. Because this narrative that that I'm going to preach on, John chapter 7, starting in verse 53, and then going to John chapter 8, verse 11, probably didn't belong in the earliest, in in the original text of this gospel. It's absent from most of the oldest copies of the gospel that precede the 6th century. So the first 500 years of the church were gathering up documents, manuscripts, partial manuscripts, and we're saying, let's compare, because that's how you do textual research, is you compare the ancient documents, and you have hundreds and hundreds. It's great evidence for the veracity of the New Testament. Um, but John 8 is, ba- the first 11 verses of John 8, they're just not in those earlier, and then, then about 600 uh, B.C., we find Oh, there's an there's a added passage here. I believe that this event took place. It's totally consistent with everything we know about Jesus and the Gospels. It's not like this is new doctrine that comes out of John 8, 1 to 11. But it was probably inserted by a well-meaning scribe saying, we have this text, it's authoritative, but we don't know where to put it. Let's put it in end of John 7. That's a good, and they, they, they probably just inserted it in about 5, 600, eight, you know, A.D., and that's why the textual evidence shows that, gee, that's, that kind of com- comes a few hundred years after this gospel was probably written, okay? So I, I still embrace it as authoritative and authoritative uh, teaching of Christ received by the church and meant to speak to you. And it, again, it certainly reminds us of everything we know about Jesus. So that was just a minor scholarship note because you probably have that little bracket thing in your text, okay? This is what this passage is about. It's about Jesus and his response to sinners. It's a message that you need to hear. I need to hear it. I need to preach this to myself this morning. Because the Christian life is tough. It's a marathon. You might be able to sprint 100 yards or so and, and, and feel pretty good about it, but the Christian life is a long haul. And we are so cognizant of the fact that we always seem to fall short of God's standards of what God has calls, calls us to be that sometimes we just feel like giving up. Or we feel like God has given up on us, again, because we're so familiar with our frailty and sin. You and I will not be able to make it over the long haul if we don't listen to what Jesus is saying to us in this passage. And it starts with a trap of guilt, verse 1, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, Early in the morning, he came to the temple, again to the temple, and the people came to him, 
and he sat down and taught them. The scribes, the Pharisees, they were the religious sheriffs, the posse, the authorities, they brought a, a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst. This is the second place winner of the mother of all interruptions contest. Jesus is seated with this crowd, this group, and he's having a Bible study. Play, the house is packed. And, oh, by the way, the, who's, you know what the first place winner is? First place winner of the mother of all interruptions, in Jesus' is the gospel, is when Jesus is teaching a Bible study, and all of a sudden the roof starts to crumble. And he looks, and there's these, like, <laughs> four heads looking down, saying, we clear? And they start lowering a paralytic down in the, middle, in the midst of that house in the middle of his Bible study. And you know the story. Jesus says, what are you doing? I'm busy. I'm teaching a Bible study. Go away from me, he said. That's not what he said. I was just checking to make sure. It's early, but some of you might have been asleep, so I was just checking. No, he, and he heals the paralytic. And they, that, was a, that was like the first place from, in my book. Uh, mother of all interruptions. Anyway, this is a close second. In verses 4 and 5, charges against this woman are announced. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? And John comments, this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. They're trying to take Jesus down. This poor woman is just a pawn in their scheme. The Old Testament law that's being referenced by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Sadducees um, are, is in, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, the law says, verses 22 to 24, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. If a man happens to meet a town, in a town a virgin pledged to be married and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate that, of that town and stone them to death. The girl, because she was in a town and did not scream for help, and the man, because he violated another man's wife, you must purge the evil from among you. How would that work for us today? There'd be like very few people alive here, right? Heavy law. Heavy. Certainly by our standards today. And let me say two things about this. First, we've got to understand that Israel was a chosen nation. Just a little teeny group of, you know, tr some little tribe in the desert, right? And God says, I'm going to set you apart from everyone else in the world, and it's through you the promise will come, right? The promised one will come. But you've got to be a holy nation. You've got to be set apart. You're going to believe in one God, not many. This is monotheism. It's the only one out there. And you've got to reflect my holy standards. And so they were severe. And we look aghast at that. But this was God's expression to the world about good and evil, right and wrong. What is the law? This is God's intent. And if you sin... You will pay. It's foreshadowing the only payment that really mattered, the death of God's son. So God is being hard on the Israelites, but he's going to be harder on his son, who will eventually pay for every sin ever committed by humanity. Anyway, God's attitude towards sin has not changed one bit. He's not gotten soft in his old age. Boy, I was really zealous back then, wasn't I? No, God is still hates sin with a, a white-hot hatred. But his hatred towards sin was poured out upon his son on the cross so that those who are in Christ are delivered from wrath. Secondly, the death penalty was actually rarely administered in the Jewish culture. I've read a number of Jewish witnesses or scholars who note that in order for the death penalty to apply, there must have been, have been two witnesses who had warned the person or persons about to commit the sin 
uh, that the act they were about to commit um, was punishable by death, then the person would have had to immediately engage in that sin without delay in order for the death penalty to apply. So obviously, those scenarios rarely ever happened. Um, and, 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 and still, the, the law stood to teach people about the seriousness of violating the seventh commandment, the sanctity of marriage. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So whatever, whatever however they, um, they executed the punishment, it sounds like it wasn't like a common thing. It was a very, it was meant more to teach how extreme that sin was, right? It, it, you know, don't do that. That's punishable by death. Don't do that. Well, this is what they're using to trap Jesus, this law, this command. What's missing in this makeshift uh, trial, by the way? Or who's missing? Yeah, last time I checked, there needs to be two people in this transaction, right? So there's just a woman, which tells me these people are not interested in justice. This, this gal, again, is just a, a useful pawn. Using her to achieve their evil end of taking Jesus down. They said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. A brilliant scheme, if you think about it. If Jesus said to this woman, um, if, if, Jesus, if Jesus said, this woman should be stoned, let's, let's stone her in a, obedience to the law, he would have undermined you know, his, his reputation as being a friend of sinners. Jesus was growing in popularity because he was different than all the teachers. Um, he taught with authority, and yet he had mercy on the broken, on sinners. And he was gaining popularity, and maybe the Pharisees thought, if we hold him to the law, the letter of the law, his movement will fizzle out because he'll be seen as being a hard nose like everyone else. Maybe. And then they thought, perhaps, if Jesus said, hey, give this woman a break, do not stone her, then he could have been publicly discredited as an enemy of Moses, their superhero, and the in God's law, which no prophet or man of God would be an enemy of. So they kind of got him in a lose-lose. Either way, you're going to you're going to lose some credibility with the crowd as you answer this you're trapped on the horns horns of a dilemma a dilemma tension is high crowd is waiting for a reply and the pharisees just think they got him nailed until jesus answers them jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. So he did this. I had to eat my water. I was just thinking that was not Ah, let's talk about that. I like it. That's what I'm asking, too. One of the astonishing things that we pick up from John's gospel about Jesus is his ability to read the hearts and minds of men. And when you're God, you have that prerogative. You can do that. And so oftentimes in John's gospel, we see that, that Jesus is looking into the hearts of these people. And so, as he perceived the evil motives of these men before him, the text said he didn't say anything. He just bent down and started writing in the sand, writing in the dirt with his finger. And John doesn't tell us what in the world did he write. John, you could have helped us here. It's fun to speculate. Maybe he wrote a passage from the Hebrew Scriptures, there's plenty of them, that spoke of the importance of mercy. Maybe he just said, these guys are biblicists, all right, I'm going to write a Bible passage for you. 
Psalm 103, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are but dust. Maybe he just kind of wrote a scripture like that. I don't have a hard time believing that. Maybe he wrote down a passage like Exodus 23.1 that spoke of, to the injustice of what these men were doing. Do not spread false reports. Do not help a wicked man by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. Maybe he read, wrote that. Here's one. Maybe he was so disgusted and shocked by the wickedness in the hearts of these men that he was just trying to go to another place and he was just doodling. <laughs> Which I did throughout grade school. I doodled. That's, look how far I got. I was just, I, you look at my, my notes, you know, from class. And there's like pictures of the Civil, pictures of the civil War. There's tanks. There's sharks. I'm just doodling. I'm just trying to go somewhere else because this is lame. And, and maybe Jesus was just shocked and said, uh, uh. and then he says something and he goes back to doodling. Uh, I Probably not, but I had to throw that one in, doodling. This is the best one, I think. Some of you probably think it's, yeah, you probably hear it coming. Maybe Jesus, being omniscient, began to write down the sins of this woman's accusers. Name, sin. Name, sin. And that's, a, a, that's not a far-fetched looking at the context, because what happens as soon as Jesus starts doing that? When they, when they heard it, let he without sin throw the first stone. They went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, right? It's fun to speculate. God hasn't chosen to reveal what Jesus wrote in the dirt on that day. But what Jesus said is, is actually much more significant than what he did or didn't write on the ground. Jesus said, hey, no big deal. Everybody slips up now and then. Besides, you can't take the Bible that literally. How could a loving God make such demands and expect us to follow them? Jesus didn't say that, did he? He didn't make light of the woman's sin or disrespect the law of Moses. His point to his enemies was merely this. You are in no position to pass judgment on her. Why? Well, what was her sin? Adultery. What was their sin? Using this woman for their evil purposes, hatred and conspiracy to murder the Son of God. You're not in a place, a, a, a position to play judge. How effective was his response? The older ones leave first. With age comes wisdom. They know they're beat. And maybe something written in the dirt did not help their cause. Because they leave. And now the teaching, verses 10 and 11. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? 
Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, well, I do, because I'm God and I'm holy, and you are a sinner, and you deserve my judgment, because I have every right in the world to judge you. Is that what he said? Sometimes in our minds we hear him saying that, but that's not what the Bible says. Neither do I condemn you. He did have, by the way, every right to condemn. Unlike these other these men, he had the right. But instead, he extended mercy. He didn't give her what she deserved. He gave her what she desperately needed. He gave her forgiveness. Not condemnation. Forgiveness. And it was only after he offered her gift of, the gift of forgiveness that does he admonish her with the words, go and leave your life of sin. The sequence of that makes all the difference in the world in terms of your religion. If you don't appreciate the sequence, you're a behavioralist. You're a behavior manager. If you understand the sequence, you're a Christian. Because what's the sequence? Jesus is first her champion, her redeemer, before he tells her to clean up her life. It's not, you clean up your life and then I'll think about forgiving you. That's religion. The gospel is, you are forgiven. But now go lead a new life. Totally different directions. The problem with most religious folks, not you, but the Baptists down the, church, uh, down the street, yeah, you can laugh at that. The problem with most religious folk is that we don't want to waste our time championing sinners in their plight. We want to skip all that and nail them for their sin. Most of the non-Christians you know, what's the first thing they think about when they think about Christians? Judgment. Judgment. They don't feel they, hypocrites or ju yeah, they don't feel comfortable or accepted by us because we're really good at judging people. Mm. Yeah, we've got to get these people to rethink that. Because that's not what we learn of Jesus in the gospel. That's not what Jesus came to do. Didn't come to judge the world, but to redeem the world, right? And notice, too, that Christ's compassion for this woman was not contingent on her response. He didn't say, okay, let's make a deal. You leave your life of sin, and then I'll forgive you. Again, no, he first granted her mercy, and then he calls her to live a new life. The point is this. It is grace that changes lives, not the law. That's why Christ came. That's the miracle of grace. It's not rules, it's not guilt, it's not fear of punishment, it is grace that changes lives. 
And sadly, many who claim to be Christ followers, not here, but the Lutheran church down the street, they, they're motivated by something else. They've left the life-transforming truths of the, of the gospel of grace for the gospel of sin management. God is all about get, you getting yourself in line for God because he's very disappointed with you. And um, when, you, when you're not really happy about yourself, and you're so familiar with your sins and unworthiness, what do you do to take your mind off your own in, uh, frailty and, and foul? You, you turn your eyes on other people and you start nailing, you say, okay, I'm bad. I'm sure there's people worse than me. Kevin, yeah, Kevin's worse than me. Let's work on Kevin, you know what I, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but it, it's, it's just indicative. People who don't feel good about themselves, they turn on others. People who know they're not worthy, they find somebody else who's less worthy, right? That's not, that's not what we're called to be not called what, what we're called to do. We're called not to be behavior referees, not to wallow in self-condemnation and guilt, but to be recipients and conduits of God's mercy. Here's what Jesus is saying in these things. If you are prone to judging and criticizing others, Here's what Jesus says to you. Put down your stones. Put down your rock. The next time you feel like thinking or saying something critical of someone, ask yourself, what's my motive? Is it to help or to hurt? Is it to build up, to heal, or is it to tear down and destroy? There's no question that we are to hate sin, and sometimes we're called to confront it in the lives of people, both in our lives and the lives of others. But remember that Jesus cautioned us that it's really important for us to look at our own eye and make sure that there's not a log in it. Take out the log in your own eye before you try to remove the speck in another's eye. Because we are all bent and broken. We are all flawed. And sometimes, again, sometimes we just like to focus on the sins of others in order to face the sin in ourselves. It's tragic. And if I read my Bible correctly, Jesus does not look favorably on people who pass judgment on others without mercy. In Matthew chapter 18, I'm going to read you a, a passage. I've, I've, um, it's from the New Living Translation, just because it's a little more readable. This is what Matthew 18 says, starting in verse 21. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? I think I heard it that the, the rabbinical number was three. That was a common number. Whoa, I'm a, I'm a holy man. I forgive you three times. Four times, you're nailed. That was big. So Peter says, well, I'm going to ask a public question. You know this. When you ask a public question, it has to make, you have to sound good and smart. And so he goes, I will double it and add one for luck. You know, add one for good measure. I'll say seven. And that'll, then I'll really impress people. Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Jesus said that because he knew that Peter knew math like I know math. I don't know what that is. Exactly. You know, some of you go, what's 70 times 7? Quickly. You nerds. All of you who said the number were, are nerds. I don't know what the number is. I'm bad at math. That's the point. It's just a lot. Don't worry about it. Just keep forgiving. Anyway, so I had to pick on the uh, math people here. No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors had brought in, uh, he was brought in, owed him a million dollars, millions of dollars. 
He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, everything he owned, to pay for the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars, and he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. Now when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse your brothers and sisters, if you uh, refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. That's a story, a parable that Jesus told to teach about the importance of receiving forgiveness and extending it to others. Receiving God's forgiveness and extending it to others. You are a conduit of God's mercy. And if you're not, you don't get it. If you're not, you don't know it. You don't know God's mercy. To know God's mercy is to be a conduit of God's mercy because you know you don't deserve it. And the least thing you can do is forgive others as you have been forgiven. Put down your stones. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. One day the great Puritan preacher George Whitfield saw a condemned criminal on his way to the gallows, the death penalty, and he uttered these now famous words, there but for the grace of God go I. And that's what I say every time I read about someone's moral failure. First thing is not, what a lousy person. What an awful individual. I say, Lord have mercy. There, but for the grace of God, go I. That's how we should view people who are caught up in sin. Give people a break. Yes, they need, to know, they, they need to repent. Yes, they need to do better. And you do too. Focus on you getting better. And remember that it's grace, unmerited favor, not judgment, that is the best motivator for change. That's what you have received from God. That's what God tells you to share with others. Put down your stones. Now, this is my second word to you that I get from the text. Let God's grace transform you. To those who tend to suffocate themselves in their own guilt and self-condemnation, Jesus is saying to you this morning, hear him, no one condemns you. He says to you, where are they? Where are your accusers? Did no one condemn you? I don't condemn you either. Paul put it well in Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now a little bit of condemnation, a good deal of condemnation, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, because they are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. God sees you holy and blameless because of your standing in Christ, which is by faith. For those who struggle with accepting this, I'm going to just share some truth statements from the Bible. And now I want you to close your eyes again and hear these statements. God is not angry with you. 
God is not keeping score. The psalmist, I love what the psalmist said. He says, Lord, if you were a God who count iniquities, you count iniquities, who could stand? There's forgiveness with you that you might be feared. All of your sins, past, present, and future, were nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. Right? There's not a sin that you commit that God says, well, I didn't know you were going to do that. Where'd that come from? It's been paid for. God's love for you is constant and is not dependent on how well you are doing. Okay? Man loves differently. God's love is constant. It's not dependent on your performance. Hear me. Nothing, nothing, not even yourself shall be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Hear me. The most pleasing work that you could ever render to God and really the only work that he requires is to trust in his mercy for sinners. Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me a sinner. That is the sacrifice that God requires of his people. That is the most pleasing thing you can render to God. Trusting in his mercy. Let God's grace transform your life because grace, not guilt, is the most powerful life-changing force in the world. Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, we are weak. Sometimes we're so slow to believe what you say to us in your gospel. We are so familiar with our sin and our unworthiness. We always remind ourselves of how we must be dis disappointing you, letting you down, failing to be the Christians we're called to be. Lord, have mercy on us in our weak faith. Increase our faith to believe you when you say, neither do I condemn you. So bless us as we ponder these truths, and I do pray that they would transform us, trusting your grace for us and your mercy, and then using us to be conduits of your mercy to sinners like us. Amen. Let's stand as we sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Amen. Our relationship with God is by grace through faith. And if you don't know that grace, if you've never received Christ as your Savior, and you'd like to, I'll be up here for a bit. You can come up and talk about that, okay? So I'd be happy to talk with you about how to know Christ in a saving way. Now receive the benediction. Go forth into the streets of this world. May you go with a memory of this hour when you've refreshed your souls in the presence of God and his people. May you... Um, Go with the intent to carry his love and extend it to your family and your friends and everyone you meet along the way who are in need. Go with courage with a resolve not to sin and go with the exciting reminder that this is Jesus at any time may come again. Amen. God bless you. Give you a good week.